20. And I'll read a verse of scripture there. And let me just preface everything I say today with this comment. I am not mad at anybody. <laughs> I am nobody's hater. I'm not going after anybody. But it's important uh, for me as the servant of the Lord to make sure that you are aware of the dangers not the dangers that might impact you, the dangers that are impacting you, that have already impacted you, so that you get a sense of where you stand uh, in, in, the, in the panoramic view of things. Acts chapter 20, I'll begin reading with verse 29. This is Paul. Uh, Luke is writing, but he's writing of Paul's words and adventures. And Paul says, for I know this, that after my departing, that means after his death, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, meaning that they would enter into the parameters of the church and they would not be sparing the flock. Also, in addition to that, he says, of your own selves shall men arise, meaning out of the church itself shall men arise speaking perverse things. It speaks of uh, a gospel that is perverted, a gospel that distracts God's people from the core meaning of the Bible. We live in a time right now that uh, most, most Christians don't really know what the core theme of this Bible is. If you ask probably, if you ask 10 people what is in, in one sentence, what does the Bible say, most would probably answer God loves you. Some would answer, judge not, lest you be judged. <laughs> but neither of those is right. And we would answer it wrong because we don't know this book. We've listened to people who talk about this book, but we don't know the book. In the third chapter of Genesis, we see sin come into the human family. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God build and lay out his blueprint in how that he was going to ultimately deal with sin through the prophecies. On the cross, we see God's solution to sin, which is the Savior. That is the centrality of this book. But most no longer know that. And it's because grievous wolves have entered in. From our own selves, have ministers have been lifted up speaking perverse things. And, and I'm going to make some of you mad this morning, but Merry Christmas. Some of you are not going to like what I'm saying this morning, but you need to hear it so that you can at least have the knowledge. Whether you act on it or not, that's up to you. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you this morning, and I just ask, Lord, that you would temper my words, that you would give me grace to speak truth into the ears of your people. And that your anointing would be here, Lord, that what is said might, might successfully enter into the hearts and might illuminate us and educate us and open our eyes, giving us discernment in these dangerous times. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for those that will be giving the offering over the course of this service here in the worship room, those who will be giving across the online experience. We ask you to bless those families, return it unto them. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. And we thank you. Amen. So we have the scripture says here, Paul said, after I pass away, grievous wolves shall enter in, meaning they originate on the outside and they come to the inside. And then in addition to that, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. We're in a time now that if you turn on YouTube or if you turn on the television set or if you look at the mega national ministers, none of them talk about sin, personal sin. But yet everybody in this room, everybody watching by the webcast, you have sin in your life, but nobody's talking about it. <laughs> nobody's telling you there's a way out of your sin. There's a Savior that will come into your life and he will teach you how to walk away from your sin little by little, move through sanctification. But you don't hear the word sanctification. You don't hear the word salvation. And you don't hear the word sin unless we're talking about the transgender group. But a sinner is supposed to sin. That's what they do. 
But we that have been changed, we that have been born again, somebody needs to tell us about the process of walking away from your sinful activity to a place called sanctification. But we don't hear it. And, and why is that? It's because grievous wolves have entered in to the flock. We know them. Many of us, we know their names. We're afraid to say them. <laughs> but we know their names. They're national preachers. You can go watch 10 of their uh, sermons, if they even will put their sermons on the internet at all, and none of them have to do with sin or salvation, which is, again, the centrality of this book. They will tell you how blessed you're going to be. They will give you the arithmetic calculation to know what time your season comes in. Have you heard that? It's, it, it's a certain season. There is one scripture in this book that talks about seasons. For everything, there is a time and a season. And they built this whole false theology on, uh, well, it's just not your season yet. Well, that's not what this book says. God doesn't move for his people in seasons. He moves for his people as their father whenever they need it. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace, cry out for help and mercy, not in your season, in the time of need. But yet we follow these false preachers who preach a skinny down gospel and here's why they do it. They want your money. Every last one of them is a multimillionaire. You look at the national preachers. They preach what they preach because they need your money. Because they can't make the next Learjet payment if you don't pay it. <laughs> they can't make the next Mercedes payment or the mansion payment that they have unless you give them money. So whatever that you want to hear, they will tell you that how God's going to bless you. How you can learn to bring the champion out of you. <clears throat> but none of it is true. It's all perverse. And Paul warned us 2,000 years ago that this was going to happen. He warned us that this would be the state the, uh, of the end of the church, that we would have people that make merchandise of God's people. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I need your money, too. I've got to pay for this building. But I don't have a Learjet, a mansion, or a Mercedes. And here's a good thing. I don't even want one. You know what I want to do? I want to give what I know about this book into your heart. So in that moment, you're not deceived. You're, you're not without knowledge concerning God's word. But right now, we have the church sitting knowing practically nothing about this book at all. Paul goes on to say this. He wrote his final epistle uh, to Timothy, his young protege. In Timothy chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, again, this is Paul. And he says to Timothy, he, he knew that he was about to pass off the scene. He knew that his life was to be endangered and he would soon be dead. And as he writes this epistle, he says, Timothy, I charge thee, verse, T, verse 2, I charge thee, therefore, by God the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. The, what, the phrase, I charge you, it just means I impose this obligation on you. I'm giving you a direct command before God. And that command is that you preach the word. You preach the word. Now, that didn't just go to Timothy. That went to everybody who stands behind the sacred desk and lifts up God's word. No man on this planet has any permission to preach anything other than God's word. But yet this morning, you're going to find preachers all over the nation preaching the revelation of the candy cane. The red speaks of the blood. The white speaks of the purity. The, the shape of the candy cane is like a, a shepherd's staff. And all other type of nonsense with the word of almighty God right in front of him. He won't open up any part of it. And, and that, that's, not the, that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is that we put up with it. We put up with it. We just keep writing checks. Send them another check. <laughs> While the real preachers that will preach something to kind of stir you up. We let them go hungry. <laughs> we don't like them preachers. And Paul speaks that. He said this day was coming that the real preachers of God would be diminished and the false preachers would be exalted. 
This is exactly what happened when Jezebel married Ahab and as she moved into Israel, she diminished the worship of Jehovah and she exalted the worship of Baal. And here's how deceptive it is. And, and here's what we have to understand. Israel was worshiping Baal, but they called him by the name Jehovah. But it was Baal worship. You see, Satan is very subtle. I'm going to talk about this in, in the 11 o'clock service, the, the nuances, the subtleties of Satan, how he moves. And it says, if you don't have discernment, and there's only one place to get it, you can't pray for it. You got you to know God's word. See, the greatest discernment in the world, you can go, you could go on a 30-day fast and pray eight hours of every one of those 30 days. You will never understand what he clearly told us in the book of Revelation. <laughs> this is the easiest place to know what's coming. It's the easiest place to know what's happening. So he says in Timothy, I charge you, I'm giving you a command. You preach the word. Be instant, in season, and out of season. There was a time that this word was in vogue. There was a time in this nation that before politicians voted for policy, they called the national preacher to find out, well, how does God stand on this? I'm telling you the truth. They made the phone call and they didn't vote on something until they checked with the preacher. But now we're in a place of preaching. You can't say nothing about politics. Don't, don't say nothing. That's not your place. That is my place. That is my place. And you know why? Because we're sheep. We're sheep. And we, we have to be led or else we go astray. Can anyone say, well, that, not me. I've never gone astray. <laughs> That's right. That's right. None of us can say that. All of us have gone astray. The Bible tells us all of us have gone astray in Isaiah. He says, preach it in season, out of season. Here's what he says. I want you to reprove the church. I want you to rebuke the church. Uh, and I want you to do it with all long suffering, patience, all long suffering. And I want you to do it doctrinally. So that it's not an opinion of the person that stands here. So that he can open the book and grammatically show you by the words of a word for word translation, the doctrines on which he bases uh, his stance. But when you say theology or doctrine now, people just turn off. As a matter of fact, in so many churches, the people are totally unmoved unless you turn this baby on. <laughs> if you turn this on, everybody's, everybody's moving. But as soon as you open the words of the living God, it's like a slumber spirit and people. And it's because you're not familiar with the beauties, the, the beauties that are in this book. And I'm not accusing you. I'm not beating you up. And I know all of us to differing degrees uh, have, have relationship with this book. But I'm telling you from the pulpit to the porch, all of us, none of us are close enough to this book as we need to be. We're in the last moment. And when you're getting your theology from Instagram, when your theology is coming from Facebook, you got nothing. You got a twisted man-made theology that pleases the flesh. This Bible is offensive. It's offensive. It was written to bring you and I in conflict with our sin. It was written to bring you and I in conflict with the, with the dark and evil world. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring you peace. I come to bring you a sword. I come to divide you from some folks. But now when you look at the leadership of the church in the United States, you find that they're buddy buddies with the world. Well, if, if, if it was so, if, if I was sitting under one of these preachers, I would be asking, why is my pastor on Oprah Winfrey? What, what communion does light have with darkness? And, and now, and while he's there and he has a national voice, why isn't he mentioning Jesus Christ? <laughs> if he's a pastor, why isn't he leading her to the Lord? He says, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long sufferings and doctrine because, here's why, here's why he told Timothy to do it, because the time will come 
when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're in that hour right now. The church really can't take sound doctrine. If, if you were to preach, if you were to go to Joel Osteen's church, being welcome there, of course, and you could preach there for one week every night and you preached on the, the biblical doctrine of hell, nobody would be there at the end of the week. They would all leave. Because the time is right now that the church universal in general terms can no longer endure sound doctrine. Why? Why? How did that happen? Next sentence. Because or rather, but after their own lust shall they heap. That means multiply to themselves teachers having itching ears. It means that they, they don't want a man of God that will storm across the pulpit and bring conviction upon their life. Not condemnation, conviction upon their life. They, the church doesn't want that anymore. The church wants a pillow prophet that will make them comfortable in their sin. But I'm here to tell you this morning, hell is hot and eternity is long. And Jesus is a savior and we have a choice to make. As to whether we want to accept his saving grace or as we want to go on in our own way. And let me say this, just being in church means nothing to God. It means nothing. You got to get the church in you. Because you got to have a living relationship for him. If there was no church, I would have got up this morning and prayed anyway. As a matter of fact, I don't even wait for the church to assemble. I get up early. I get up early and come down here at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning because the church is on the inside. Hallelujah. How many ever preached in your car while you're driving? <laughs> See, that means that's the church in you. You don't have to wait for everybody else to assemble. I got this. I got a word in my own heart. Can we put up uh, that slide, please, uh, called Preachers? In the last 20 or 30 years, we've heaped to ourselves preachers having itching ears. These are some of the biggest heretics over the past 30 years, some of which are still operating within the church. Most of them, most of them you can call by name. Some of them are absolutely, uh, I, I, I don't know how people couldn't know. Look at the, the very top row, the fourth from the left. I think that guy's smoking a joint. <laughs> Can you tell? It looks like he's smoking a joint. But even if it isn't a joint, he's smoking something. And what kind of preacher? These are the ones that have come into the church and they have preached a gospel that is perverted. They have not taught on sin and salvation. They've taught on everything else under the sun that will make money. That will make money. But after concerning the people of God, but after their own lust shall heap, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And these teachers shall turn away their ears from the truth. They will not preach the truth, but rather they will turn the people's ears away from the truth unto fables. This is the problem with the church is that. 50 years ago, these guys would have been laughed off the platform. If you, if you had a man 50 years ago that stood on the platform and said, what was it, 30 days or 14 days of purpose? What was it, the purpose-driven life? Was it 14 days? 40. That's how weak it is. It's diluted. <laughs> 40 days of purpose. He would have been laughed off the stage. But now the man can make multiplied millions of dollars by turning God's people into merchandise. Saints, this is the problem with the church. And God told us, the prophecy of old told us the end days would be this way. And now here we are. Here, here we are now. Is everybody with me this morning? <clears throat> this is going to sting a little bit. And I, I, I love you. That's why I have to tell you. Many of you right now, the book that's on your lap or on your phone is not even a Bible. It's just a religious book. And we haven't known that over the past 30 years, have you noticed translation after translation after translation? Have you noticed that? They've got so many translations now. You know, they got a rapper's translation. Got cuss words in it. 
And a translation is simply a paraphrase. A, a paraphrase, the term paraphrase, if you look at the American Heritage Dictionary, it means that it is an alteration to a text to bring about a different impact than originally designed. I'm going to have to ask you, could you put it up that second slide? I, I just have to teach the saints because you have to know it. I wasn't going to put this one up for this, for this service, but I will. There are, the, the Bible was translated word for word from the original Greek and Hebrew into the English language. There's a few translations like that, the American Standard, the King James, New King James, New American Standard, and a few more. And you can tell a word-for-word -word translation because it's bumpy. It reads bumpy. But what has happened, beginning with the NIV Bible, which is not a Bible, you can look at the left-hand side and you can see the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, the King James, New King James. All of those in the blue, those are word for word. That means that the translator looked at the Greek word and said, here's the exact word in English that it means. And, and that's why King James is bumpy. But then as you move into the green area, you have a meaning for meaning translation. Now, that means that the person read it and said, well, here's what it means, and wrote in the translation what they thought it meant. But you have to question, well, who, who said it meant that? <laughs> how, how, how educated were they in theology? How, how much do they know about the Word of God or the character of God? So you slide, and you begin to, to slide from the meaning to meaning to the thought for thought. Here's the thought that it was trying to carry. And in those translations of which you see the uh, New International Version, the New Living Text, I believe the in, yeah, New Living Translation and the CSB Translation, those are thought for thought. And then finally sliding all the way to the right are the paraphrase Bibles. <laughs> it, 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 and really at this point, they're, they're just trying to give you a reflection of the Word of God. And yet, here's the thing you have to understand. If we are to understand doctrine, doctrine cannot be based on anything except the original word-for-word -word translations. And let me tell you something. If you learn Greek and you know Greek, Greek is better than the King James. <laughs> if you can read Hebrew, that, that's better uh, than a translation because it's the original language. But yet, most of the church today, I think probably 60% of the church, use a new international version of the Bible to try to learn from. I'm not beating you up. I'm giving you information. The New International Version, it was written because the marketeers wanted to broaden the, the, uh, the, the, the selling platform of the Bible. They wanted to broaden their market. And so it was toned down so that a seventh grader could understand the terminology in the New International Version. That's why it's so easy to read. And people buy it because it's easy to read. <laughs> but, but it's not the word of God. And saints, we've, we're here at the end of days. Jesus is getting ready to bust those clouds open. The Antichrist is getting ready to make his advent. And most of us don't even have a Bible. That's the problem with the church. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm angry, does it? I, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm angry. I'm not. You know why? For 38 years, I've hid this word in my heart. I hope you make it. <laughs> I do. I hope you make it. But Jesus only left us two things. He left us this Bible and he left us his spirit. Though, If you got your hopes on anything else, you ain't going to make it. You're, you're in trouble. I, I, I admonish you this morning. Get into your word. Stop listening to what people say. You see, when the COVID thing came out, uh, and this, this just irked me to no end. And then after that, they had the vaccination. And I don't care whether you took it or not. That, that's on you. I don't care. But I want you to show you the techniques that are being used. People began saying on all the social platforms and everywhere else to Christians, well, if you don't take the vax, you don't love your neighbor. The Bible said love your neighbor. And if you love your neighbor, you got to do this for your neighbor. 
<laughs> and you're going to find as time goes on, more and more, people who don't know the Bible, but just know enough to be dangerous, are going to lead the people that should have known the Bible. <laughs> that they should have known exactly what, what the Word says. We're in a dangerous time. And too many of us don't even read the word. Don't even read it. Now, I love you, but in that hour, if I'm there when you stand before God, I'm going to say, God, I preached it. I don't know why they didn't know because I, I know I preached it. I did everything I knew. I, I mean, I ran folks out. I was preaching so hard. Some folks just got mad and left, but I was preaching it. I don't want to be a witness against you, but I will say this. Make time for this book. Get a real Bible, number one. As a matter of fact, while I'm here, <laughs> you need to get on Amazon and buy you a case of King James Bibles because they're not going to be on the market that much longer. The one on your phone, they'll pull that thing off your phone like that. <laughs> You'll, you'll, you'll bring up your Bible app and it'll say server out of service. You need to get you a case of paper Bibles and get those on the left, the real Bibles. Don't get the paraphrase. Get a real Bible because you're going to need man doth not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God, not by every meaning, not by every thought, not by every paraphrase, but by every word. You're going to need this. I, mean, I mentioned this uh, several weeks ago. Uh, I, I was buying a Bible and I, I had my, my daughter came to me. She said, Dad, I go half with you. <laughs> so we bought a case and we split it in half. Because when the going gets rough, you're going to be running out of these. You know, this book is not legal in most nations. Did you know that? In, in some nations, you can get the de death penalty for having this book. <laughs> and here we are in the lap of luxury with, with, with uh, the access to Bibles everywhere and we don't even have time <laughs> to avail ourselves of the Word of God. And th here's something else. The Bible bookstore is one of the most dangerous places that a Christian can be because you've got to walk through all that mess because they keep the Bibles in the back. <laughs> just have Amazon ship one to your door. You don't have to look at the crystals and all that other stuff in there. Is this good preaching? Saints, we have to get serious about what we're doing. Do you not see the Antichrist coming? Do you not see the society turning anti-Christian? Do you not understand persecution is at the door? Our leadership has totally failed us. The nation is folding. Our laws are, are just falling apart. Do you not see that? And the first thing that happens is the Christians uh, go, go to Nigeria this morning. Christians are being killed. Go, go to Saudi Arabia. Go to Iran. If you, if you convert to Christianity, they will take your head off. And here we are complaining that our cell phone's battery doesn't hold up long enough. <laughs> Things are getting ready to get rough in this nation. And I'm giving you a warning as a man of God. I, I don't know how it's going to end up. I have no insights on how it's going to end up. But I do know this. You're going to need this book. You're going to need this book. And as soon as they tell you that it's not legal, don't turn it in. When they do their Bible buyback program, don't give them your Bible. Amen. Come and take it. <laughs> I'm not giving it up. I'll die on this Bible. But there'll be a lot of people that give it up, that back up, that, that throw it away, and they'll be just like the Israelites that were on their knees before the golden idol of Nebuchadnezzar because the Antichrist has an idol. Saints is coming. So I said, what are you talking about, Pastor? Read the book. <laughs> oh my God, read the book. It's here. 
And, and it, you say, well, I'm young in the Lord. I don't, I, don't, not, I, I don't know all of these deep things. Go to our sermon archives. Go to the book of Revelation. Go to any of the New Testament books. They're all out there. Word for word, we do our very best to open it up so that people can see it and understand what's coming. And it's upon us now. Amos said this in his prophecy. He said, Behold, the days come, and saith the Lord, that I will send a famine. God said, it didn't just happen, and the devil didn't do it. God said, I will send a famine in the land. It will not be a famine uh, for, of bread nor of thirst of water, but it will be a famine for the hearing of the words of God. Now get this. It doesn't say there will be a lack of preaching. It says there will be a lack of hearing the word of God. I, I went to a, a church I was invited to several years ago, a number of years ago, here in town, and I went in a uh, it was young people. It was a younger group of people. And uh, I, I don't know, I was probably 20 years younger. It's been that long ago. And so I was, I was much more fiery than I am now, energetic. And uh, it started just wonderful. And they were in worship. And I was like, man, look at these young people. They are just worshiping. My God, this is wonderful. And then the worship ended and I stood up to preach and I saw it. It was like just a fall came upon them, and I just saw them all just start going to sleep. <laughs> and it wasn't because my preaching was dull, because I, I was fiery. <laughs> it was simply because there was no interest in the things of God. And the biggest ministers you see right now, they exalt their worship ministries above his word. There's nothing wrong with worship. Thank God for worship. I, I love this and I need this. But nothing takes the place of this. Nothing takes the place of this. <laughs> I've got about five more minutes. I've got about another half hour of message, but I've got five more minutes and I've got to let you go. In the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 6, now Amos said the day is coming that I'll send the famine in the land. It'll be a famine for the hearing of the words of God. And we see that uh, allegorized really in the famine that came upon Israel in 2 Kings. Beginning with chapter 6 and verse 25, it says, And there was a great famine in Samaria. Could have said America. Because we're not getting fed. There's no word in this nation. There's very little word in this nation. It used to be tent revivals all over the nation. You could almost step into any. The Baptists used to preach better than most churches. The, the Methodists used to preach hard. Now they got gay, transgender clergy. <laughs> the Episcopalians used to have something. Now everybody got about as little as, the, as Catholicism. And, and really, it's only little bitty preachers and little bitty churches like this that got nothing to lose. If you get there and say, well, I'm taking my money and leaving. <laughs> I love you. If you ever want to come back, we'll still be here. <laughs> and there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged. They besieged it. Uh, the besieging means that they encamp. They, 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 uh, they encamp it. They, they surround it. And they make sure that no food from the outside crops can come in. Can we put up preachers again? Can we put preachers back up again? They besiege the church and they make sure that nothing from the outside where the crops was outside of the city could come in to nourish the people. And the church has been besieged. It has been surrounded. And there's so much of the false doctrine that's flooding in that most people can't discern a real word from God anymore. <laughs> We've been cut off. You, you got to get this for yourself. You're responsible for having, it's not my responsibility. My responsibility is what I preach. Your responsibility is what you eat. <laughs> they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver. That means the head of a donkey, which has no meat on it, there's no meat on it, <laughs> but it became valuable and 
the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. And what it means is that things that had very little value suddenly carried great value. Everything was inverted. Everything turned upside down. <laughs> Get this now. There was a time that uh, a, a, a preacher who was, who was gay or a preacher who uh, did not preach the word, they had no value at all. If, listen, if, you, if a gay preacher got on stage 50 years ago, he'd have caught a beat down right on the stage for defiling it. But now what used to have no value is held up as having great value. Because we are the victims of famine. We are not hearing the word of God. And so our values have changed. Are you with me this morning? Saints, there's a problem in the church. And the problem is the church. It's you and me. Most of us have an addiction to television. But we're not addicted to the word of God. It's, uh, it's some Christmas message, isn't it? <laughs> Saints, I love you. I want you to have the truth. Turn off your television. Do you not know what an addict is? I've been an addict. An addict is that when you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes, the first thing you think about is your addiction and how to satisfy it. And some of us have the TV on before we get out to bed. We, we haven't even brushed our teeth and that is already on. And I don't care how attractive the people are on the, on the television set. That is the demon. I, I wish I had another. When I first got saved, I would hear the old preachers. They were old men back 30, 40 years ago when I got saved. And they were saying that there's a one-eyed devil sitting in your living room. And you need to get away from it. And here I am now, 40 years later, and I'm going to tell you, it's a one-eyed devil sitting in every one of your rooms, and you need victory over that thing. Unplug it, turn it against the wall for 30 days, and you'll find out what, how much of an addict you are. Amen. Man, that is good preaching. I, I feel juicy this morning. <laughs> Saints, I'm not here to offend anybody, but we need to know these things. We need to know these things. And, uh, and my job is to tell you whether, whether you want to hear it or not, my job is to proclaim it to you. Uh, and now that you have the information, uh, you do what you need to do with it uh, and come back next year because I may preach the same message over on next Christmas. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I love you. Would you bow your heads all over the room this morning? Father, we thank you for your grace this morning. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you have sent the word into our hearts to shake us, to stir us, to call us, oh God, to a closer walk with you. This world is about to wrap up. The things of this world are growing dim. But Lord, that that you give is eternal in the heavens. We thank you this morning. Now, Father, we ask you that you bring conviction upon our hearts and lives. Lord, that we would study to show ourselves approved unto God, that we might be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Come on, just lift your hands up all over the room and ask the Lord God, give me grace to come closer to your word. Give me grace, O God, conviction that I might come closer to your truth. Help me not to be distracted. Help me not to be moved away to fables. But God, help me to hold fast to the truth of the living God. Come on, just lift him up right there. Just ask him. Just ask him this morning. Praise the Lord. He is good. He is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, let me say this to each and every one of you. Happy or rather Merry Christmas. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas. Don't forget to unwrap the unspeakable gift that you got in Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, you'll stand to your feet. We'll go ahead and be dismissed. <clears throat> what I say unto one, I say unto all, watch, pray. Study your Bible every day. 
Amen. You are dismissed and I love you.